Thank you so much for taking this time in a busy week to come together. I'm Kathleen Enright, the President and CEO of the Council on Foundations. <laughs> I usually don't get a cheer reaction. Was that Nick? It was Nick. Um, it is so terrific to see philanthropy's prominent role in the conversations of this week. Um, you know how important it is that we do this work together. The themes that are happening here at the United Nations General Assembly are things that philanthropy has long cared about. Things like addressing the global climate crisis, shrinking the gap in inequality, um, thinking about addressing uh, big humanitarian crises that just keep, seem to keep expanding. The Council has had supporting global philanthropy as a priority for a very long time. Back in the 1980s, we started supporting it in earnest. In 2012, we worked hard uh, to lobby the Treasury Department to make equivalency determination repositories to, re to reduce barriers to giving so that you could give more locally. And as governments distort FARA to justify restrictions on philanthropy, we're going to be your partner to advocate and push back. We will do all that we can to make sure that U.S. foundations are trusted partners in advancing the greater good wherever you choose to do your work. So no matter what some cynical headlines say, philanthropy is stepping into many breaches and doing incredible work against emerging challenges across the globe. Now, the story of COVID is one that is still unfolding uh, and still being told. You know, you uh, led with trust. You enabled nonprofits to flexibly address the challenges that were emerging where they were. And hopefully, those are practices that will sustain over the long term. Today, we're releasing a report that shows how foundations are showing up globally. This is the state of global giving by U.S. foundations that the Council has produced over time in partnership with Candid and funded by the Hilton and Mott Foundations. Um, and here, the headline is that U.S. foundations are stepping up their giving globally. Uh, you have done this to address a variety of needs across the globe, and the numbers are pretty amazing. Since uh, 2002, funding to global giving has nearly quadrupled. In 2019, which is the latest data we have, it was $8 billion. So we know that giving globally, we've been giving more. So now how can we give better? Our speakers today are going to suggest that localization is part of that. And that is certainly part of the answer. We've got to give, to be more effective globally, we've got to give more flexible dollars more reliably to the local actors who are best positioned to drive their own development. And of course, that is true. It has long been true. But back to our global giving report right here. The data suggests we have a long way to go to make that real. Uh, in this report, only 12.6% of global grants go directly to the folks uh, in the countries that we're trying to support, 12.6%. And in fact, the majority of global focused grants, 61%, go to institutions that are headquartered in the United States. So of course, there are appropriate reasons to use uh, uh, intermediaries that are focused in the US. They play a great role. Uh, and even some that, you know, that we know well are leading the way of how you can be a U.S. intermediary and guide the way to lifting up the voices of those in the global south. Um, but the bottom line is that more dollars can and should go directly to groups, intermediaries that are located in the countries that we support and the direct groups on the ground. And so this session is part of a concerted effort by the Council to champion localization along with our members and our partners, and this is funded by the Hilton Foundation. So we hope that 25% of your dollars will be going directly to the organizations in the countries that you're hoping to affect. Um, and this is directly, oh, this is by, by 2030, which is directly lined up with the USAID goal. Uh, we'd love your engagement. We'd love you to be one of the champions of this effort because you, we know you are the committed. This is the choir we're preaching to. Um, but I bet if you run the numbers internally, 
Many of you aren't there yet either. Uh, so we're hoping that by the next time we issue this report, we can come back together and, and be very proud of the um, progress that we've been able to achieve together. So as we get started, I do want to issue a couple heartfelt thanks for the folks who are able to make this happen. We are at the Ford Foundation, and I think they have 50 some odd events going on this week, and they let us sneak one in under the wire. Um, so I really want to th say thank you to the folks up in the tech room who are helping us, to the folks who, uh, the guards who are making all of this happen, and everyone who is supporting this work. So the Ford Foundation folks, certainly uh, Hilton, who has been a partner with us, and our friends at Wings, who are a partner on this event as well. And uh, my colleagues at the council who pulled this whole thing together behind the scenes and in front of the scenes, particularly Brian Kastner. So right now, I'm gonna get out of your way and you're gonna hear from some incredibly thoughtful people who have been leaders um, in, this, uh, in this work and in this discussion. First, you're gonna hear from a pioneer in the movement. She has long uh, tried to work to shift the power, um, to rethink the way that human humanitarian aid is done, and her organization is a model of that. Uh, Dagan Ali is the executive director of Adesso in Kenya. And she is going to talk about uh, maybe some of the data in this report, maybe not. Maybe she's just going to tell us what she thinks um, about progress or lack thereof. Um, and we are just so honored to have her with us. Um, and then we will turn the stage over to Raj Kumar of DevX, who will moderate an esteemed panel. So thank you all for joining us. Um, and I will turn it over to Dagan. Um, good afternoon. I try not to do too many podium kind of speaking. <laughs> I like being part of a circle of people, um, so it feels a bit odd. But um, I'm really excited to be here today, and, um, and I'm really happy that the Council on Foundations, Wings, and Hilton are taking this step to do this research and to really understand where we are in terms of our progress on this very critical issue. Um, everybody keeps asking me, like, how do I feel since I've been doing this for so long? And <laughs> honestly, I'm tired. I'm exhausted, honestly. I have to tell you that. Um, it was in 2010 I went to a meeting in Geneva where I met Global South leaders at an ICVA event and they were all complaining about the same things that I experienced in Somalia. And then, I, first of all, it was a shock to me that the international system was basically a carbon copy um, across the world. Like every humanitarian crisis, what I experienced in Somalia was not unique. That was a shock to me. I thought it was unique because it was fragile, it was no strong government, Whatever, for whatever reasons. And then secondly, I was shocked that we were all complaining about the same system but doing nothing really about it. And we kept asking ourselves, how do we change the space? And how do we change ICVA? And that's when I told them, why are you asking them to let you in ICVA and change ICVA? ICVA is their institution. They have the right to dominate and to do what they want with ICVA. Create your own institution. And that's when I came up with the idea of find, uh, founding the first Global South Civil Society Network trying to transform the aid system, the NEAR Network. So this is from 2010 until now, that journey. And it's been a long journey. So the number of 12.6% is a really sad number. It doesn't shock me, it doesn't surprise me. Um, when we were at the World Humanitarian Summit, it was 4% according to Civicus. So there is progress. So I guess we should be hope, you know, happy for little things, little progress. But really, we could do better. And this is my message to philanthropy. I don't have a lot of time. But I've been asked to, uh, to tell you why is philanthropy different? The bilateral system is complex. They have legalistic frameworks that bind them and make it almost impossible to make the change that we need happen. I think it will happen, but I don't think it's going to be something that maybe I see in my lifetime. I'm very, very 
encouraged to see Samantha Powers and what she's trying to do within USAID, but as a recipient, a former recipient, who has now refused to take USAID funding because of how destructive it was to us, I, I know how hard it is to change that machinery. So this is where philanthropy comes in. Philanthropy is a critical part of the solution to decolonize aid, to decolonize the system. Because you have flexibility that the bilaterals don't. You have the ability to be political where the bilaterals can't. You have the ability to really um, lean into risk and trust in a way that could be revolutionary if you change your mindset and you change your systems. And that's why you are a critical part of the architecture. You need to be the role models to model the behavior and, and show and demonstrate the solutions that could happen, that could be out there. I can't expect USAID to fund small grassroots organizations that are not even legally registered, that are doing amazing things on the continent or in Asia. I can't expect them to give $5,000 grant. That's not gonna happen, really, realistically. But that can happen with philanthropy. You can fi fund political movements of change. You can fund issues around reparations. We, are, we just had a conversation at the New Humanitarian uh, just earlier, a uh, few hours ago, about reparations and how provocative it is. I can't even use the word decolonization in the halls of DFID or DFAT or USAID. But you have leaned into that language and you recognize how political the architecture is. At least domestically, you talk about decolonizing wealth. Now, turn that rhetoric to the global system that you fund and and turn the rhetoric into real action and real change of how you operate. So we all know why it's important to fund intermediaries, but I wanna give you a real, very practical reason why it's important to fund, in, I mean, to fund directly and not intermediation, model that we have currently led by the UN and the INGOs that many of you fund. The 60% of Global North, that's, those are the INGOs and the UN agencies. It's because if we understand fundamentally that the architecture is political, that the architecture was designed on purpose to ensure the poverty of Global South and former colonies, that we know the system is extremely political, then it's your role as philanthropy to fund the institutions that are on the ground working every day to address these issues, such as food sovereignty, such as reparations, such as trade, debt, cancellation, all these very political things that USAID cannot fund. It is your role to do that. That's why you are in a critical partner in the architecture. You're not, uh, a, by the way, secondary on the side. Yes, you feel that way in terms of your percentage of your funding compared to ODA. I know it feels overwhelming. But imagine that we move from 25%, all the foundations, the thousands or more foundations in the US that fund globally, if they moved from 25% to 50% of their funding. That would be hugely impactful. You created the ecosystem and the architecture for making that happen. So here's some real solutions, uh, practical things that you could do. Number one, is fund the infrastructure and the architecture, that we need to move the pipes. So we hear all, this, all the time. We don't know who's out there. We don't know how to, fund, uh, how to find local organizations in Liberia and Nepal and in India, and that's why we have started um, this platform called Kujalink. It's like a LinkedIn where you, as funders, can do a search and find partners all over the world. Practical, very practical solutions. We are trying to find a practical solution for de-risking organizations who want to get and graduate and get USAID funding or get DFID funding. And that's why we're starting a private company to, that will do the back-end systems for local organizations to do the procurement, the finance, the HR, all the pain points that we went through as a recipient of USAID funding, all the major things that really I lost, 
I can't tell you a countless number of hours of sleepover. I don't want anybody to go through what I went through at USAID. So we need to find solutions to that. So this company core will help local organizations to just outsource what the private sector does every day and they do it amazingly. But we in the public sector cannot get behind private sector solutions to problems in our, in our system. We need to find such solutions. We need to come up with innovative financing models. We need to figure out how to do intermediation at the most local level. Intermediation is not always a bad thing. But what we are uh, pushing against is the intermediation model of INGOs and UN agencies. We need intermediation model where it's locally led, locally driven, global south led. That's what we need. And if not, at least institutions that are supporting those grassroots organizations that are really extremely happy with $5,000, extremely happy with $50,000. They don't need a big check. Siegel Family Foundation does a lot of that. Thousand Currents does a lot of that. We need those kinds of models. But we also need to create these national funds led by civil society, something NIR is working on. We need to fund at scale and transform these institutions from what my mother calls professional beggars to independent agents. The day I will retire from Adesso is the day that we have an endowment that's sizable enough that I can go to Hilton Foundation and say, I have a million dollars of my own funds and I wanna partner with you and I wanna call the shots equally. That's power, yeah? That's real power. If you want to get these institutions to be sustainable, we talk about sustainability and impact. There is nothing more impactful and more sustainable than getting these institutions to have endowments. Why is it okay for a Ford Foundation to have a massive <laughs> endowment that I can't, I don't even know how many billions it is. But we in the Global South are constantly trying to figure out how to exist and pay salaries next year. That's unacceptable. And a lot of the good institutions go out of business, close their doors, because they're just constantly funded six months, one year. There's no multi-year unrestricted large-scale funding. So if you are committed to systems change, systems change is a long game. It's not two years, it's not three years, it's 15, 20 years. And the only way to do that is if these institutions have financial independence and they call the shots. And unfortunately, to, to, in my opinion, that's the real, real demonstration of shifting power. When you transition your partners from professional beggars to independents who call you out or say we don't even need your money and walk away, how do you feel about that? <laughs> that is the real test. So, I want to end by saying, please, philanthropy. I don't want to be having this conversation and come back to you in 10 years. <laughs> I want to see 70%, 50%, 25% is nothing for you all. The kind of due diligence systems that you have, you are handicapping yourself. You do not have to become a USAID. You don't. You can do this, and you can do it in a far bigger way, and you could lead the charge. So, thank you so much for your time, and I'm going to introduce Raj Kumar, who's the president and editor-in-chief of DevEx. And Raj is a very, very early ally. We've been meeting each other at these events at the World Humanitarian Summit from 2014, 2015, 2016, so we haven't seen each other in forever, and it's my privilege to welcome him to the stage. Thank you, Raj. Well, good afternoon. It's great to be with all of you. As Degan says, this has been a long road. Uh, it didn't just start here, but she's been way ahead as the rest of us were crawling and walking way ahead on this race, and now I think we're starting to catch up. But it's not so straightforward where we go from here. And so events like this one are really key. 
because we're at those early moments where even definitions start to matter. Uh, in fact, in our newsroom not long ago, one of our journalists was planning to do a story on localization and called about a dozen contacts, maybe some of you in this room, and came back to our news meeting and said, the problem I've got is I called a dozen people and I got a dozen different, different definitions of localization. Now, I think we don't even all necessarily agree on what this is we're trying to do and what the ends are. But that's a little bit what we're going to get into in this discussion. And with all of you, I'd love you to jump in and, and ask us some, some questions and press us on this panel, please. Let me just mention who, who I have here. I think people known to all of you. Peter Lawharn, to my left, the president of the Conrad N. Hilton Foundation. And Peter has spent a career on both sides of this fence, the international NGO level, smaller NGOs, and now leading one of the world's preeminent foundations. Monica Aleman is the International Program Director here at the Ford Foundation. Hi, Monica. Thanks for having us here in this beautiful space. Um, and directs gender, racial, and ethnic justice here at the Foundation. And Benjamin Belagy is the Executive Director at WINGS, uh, based in Sao Paulo. Uh, and prior to this role, you were leading the main philanthropic organization in France. International programs. For international programs, right. So it's great to have all of you here. Um, you heard some of the critique, let's say, to put it mildly, from Dagon, of all of us, of this space, of the sector that we're in. I wonder, you know, your reaction to that. Are we creating professional beggars? What is the, what is the barrier uh, to getting to the world that she would like to see? Do we even want to get to that world, you know? Do your boards want to get to that world where you're doing 50 or 70% in direct indirect giving. Maybe, Peter, I can, I can start with you. Sure. Well, I, I think uh, in all humility, I have to say guilty as charged. You know, I, historically, uh, the Hilton Foundation has done global grant making for the last 30 years, right? Uh, and yet, historically, we did it uh, almost exclusively through U.S.-based organizations. And, you know, there are reasons for that, familiarity, compliance, fear of the IRS, uh, worries about accountability, et cetera, but it, it was basically habit. Uh, and you know, it's taken us a while to decide to do differently. Uh, you know, I, I came to Hilton about seven years ago. We talked about localization, but I would say, and Dagon, you're, you're gonna say, well, it took you a while, right? <laughs> but I would say, frankly, it was COVID and DEI that got us thinking about what was really the right thing to do. And for me, the main thing a foundation can do from an equity lens and its global grant making is get more funds uh, to, to organizations that are local. Uh, and so we have, uh, we've made a commitment to, to, to really do that. I have to say, Kathleen, our baseline when we looked at it, and we did it very strictly, was not a lot rosier than the one that you said. Right? So I'm not, I'm not saying that we're starting from a better place than others, but we've made a, a whole of organization commitment to make that 25% goal and to bust through it. Again, you can keep pressing us if we're, if we're not high enough, but you know, I, I think um, it is whole of organization. It's not just your program team, although they need to be able to source, they need to do due diligence, et cetera, deal with the, the volume. Uh, but it's also your general counsel and compliance issues. It's also your communications staff. It's your board and their risk tolerance. Uh, but I would say to folks here, come on in. The water's warm. It's not difficult to do. Uh, my email is peter at hiltonfoundation.org if you want to talk about it. Uh, and I really uh, think that uh, uh, philanthropy can do much better and will do better. Thanks. But do you think it's going to be an easy transition, Peter? And I want to get Monica in this as well. In other words, you know, if it really is just a systems, you know, an internal systems, IT, accountants and lawyers kind of problem, presumably that's fairly straightforward. And we could quickly jump to much larger figures around direct giving. Or is there the same kind of issue that Dagon mentions over at USAID and in the bilateral aid system? There's a sense of control, right? Foundations have their own strategy. They want to... Yes. They, they want to uh, tackle an issue the way they want to tackle an issue. Mm -hmm. They have relationships. They have NGOs they've funded for many years. I mean, maybe, maybe there's good arguments behind that, too, by the way. Uh, I guess the question is, is it as simple as we're all kind of getting a line on this point and we just have to organize our ducks in a row in our, in our HR team and our comms team? 
or is there a, is there a fight to be had <laughs> inside the world of philanthropy? I'd love both of your takes on that, and then I'll come to you later, Benjamin. Yeah, just uh, quickly on that, I, I think there are two levels. You know, there's a, a level of funding flows that is pretty straightforward, and that a foundation can just get its own internal house uh, in order, right? I think there's another question that Dagan was really emphasizing, and that is, what's the relationship between funder and grantee? And what, how do you make that a level playing field, a partner organization, um, a, a partnership relationship? I think that takes more effort. I think it will take a longer time. But I, I think it's, it's a conversation that we should be robustly involved in. Monica, you're very familiar with these issues of power and justice. You spent a lot of your career working with indigenous groups and women's groups. How do you see this, the, the way the philanthropy world is structured? Is it gonna be straightforward now that we're kind of getting religion on this? What do you think? <laughs> mm, it's, well, hello everyone. It's good to have you at the Ford Foundation. And um, yes, again, I also, just like you, hope that one day, you know, we increase our commitment to spend down on some of our endowment. But there is a journey to get there. But just to say, you know, there are voices across the sector and inside this organization that, that make the case for that. So just wanted to start with that. Um, Secondly, I don't, I'm not sure what the question is and therefore what the answer is. You know, I know what we are discussing here and it is about, in my mind, and perhaps I got it wrong, is about moving resources to the global south. That's right. At, and just to be clear, I think that there is a clear global south also in the north, you know. So it, when you define global south from a political perspective in terms of what you are referring to when you call the global south the global south. So I think that it is important to recognize that we are all in this boat together. Now, if we are referring about the percentage of resources that are going outside of the United States, I think that there are a number of barriers that we are facing, but that we have to first start by recognizing that we are not operating in a vacuum as a sector. You know, so for me, the most important barrier that exists is the economic system that we have in place and the ways in which resources flow or the ways in which the flow of those resources are regulated or not. You know? And that turns to determine the kinds of systems or barriers that you put in place to be able to move from one place to the other. So I will say that is the first thing. Um, the second thing is, um, I don't think we can run away, and I have been at the Ford Foundation now 12 years. I don't think we can run away from our, from our fear of the unknown. We are scared about what is out there in the world. We are scared about touching uncertain terrains. And, and for a long time, we have positioned ourselves as us versus them. You know, so unless we recognize that we are in a deeply flawed system that is highly regulated and does not allow the easy flow of resources and that in fact the only flow that is permitted is that one that moves certain interests. And unless we recognize that deep down in our hearts, we are still scared of the unknown. And the unknown is someone that is in the global south, including in the US, and is someone that is often black or brown. We are not going to make the changes. So I think that yes, we can go and have a conversation about the systems and practice, but deep down we have to start by asking ourselves, 
who we are as a person, as a people, and whether we really trust and think of ourselves as equal. I can ask my friend here, I am not sure that I feel he's equal yet. Maybe we will get there, you know, but I am not sure we are there yet. Yeah, this conversation, please, that was fabulous. This kind of conversation around localization, you can have it at two levels. You can have it at this technical level where we're going to talk about intermediaries. We're going to get into this today, you know, practical issues. But it also kind of forces you to ask some fundamental questions about what is this project we're all part of here that we call global development? What is it all about? And even deeper than that, like what are we all about, right? As we undertake this, why is the world the way it is? So I do want to get, Benjamin, at some point to your, your views about how we actually can make this transition. But first, maybe just staying on this high level, do you think of philanthropy as basically a political system in some way? You know, this kind of the way it's structured, that it's, there is this natural power dynamic, big institutions in the global north with big endowments, you know, small under-resourced community groups in the global south. Is it fundamentally, is that a, a big part of why we're having this discussion? Well, I think that first, the, the philanthropic sector itself is something extremely diverse. And it's true that naturally we tend to think about, you know, the few big uh, names such a huge diversity of players that are mid-sized, big-sized, local, and you also have growing local philanthropy in the global south, in emerging economies, again, of different types. And when we talk about philanthropy at Wings, we're talking about all of this, and we're also talking about people's giving. Uh, we're also talking about um, you know, local, uh, local resources for local development. And I think that's, um, that's really important to keep that in mind when we're talking about this localization because that's where also we see, uh, you were talking about two levels, that's also where we see two levels of that discussion around the role of philanthropy in localization. One of these is about you know, what we're talking about, how can these donors from the outside, from the north, uh, channel more of their funding, if not all of their funding, why not one day, to local organizations. Uh, that's critical, and I fully agree with everything that was said. I think Degan did a tremendous job at you know, uh, making that case extremely powerful and clear. Um, there's also this other dimension about how can these same foundations, international grant makers and funders, how they can help grow local resources, local private resources for sustainable, resilient, locally owned development. And there's here a whole area of work that has been uh, uh, ignored uh, uh, and where there's a lot of potential actually. Uh, especially if you look again at that broader picture of giving and philanthropy beyond just like institutional philanthropy or endowed foundations, but you look at the availability of private resources for development on the ground. So that's where WINGS is trying to, uh, as a global network building the, 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 the field, the philanthropic sector, that's where we're trying to make that case among private donors, but also with public aid agencies, multilaterals, that they have a role to play in building the ecosystem, the infrastructure that is needed, not just to absorb foreign funding, but also to generate, harness uh, local funding at all levels of society. But then to go back to your point around, <clears throat> I think I, th I really love what you, you said as well, and, and going back to the, the values, and I, I fully agree. I think that the, the, this is a really deep conversation. It looks technical, and actually it's, it's very deep because it questions the values that lead all the rest. And, and I think that there's a risk here that we could just move the pieces of the puzzle, but we would not transform the essence of that system. And you could even have, you know, huge amounts of money going to local organizations, but they would just ask the same way as international NGOs are doing now, without consulting communities, without really being you know, sort of humble in their attitudes, and just being there to tick the boxes and implement stuff. So uh, I, I think it's really great that we're starting this conversation at that level and, and questioning you know, the guiding values that need to change, and that's the starting point for the rest. Let's imagine that we have on the live stream um, some Silicon Valley billionaire watching this, <laughs> considering their philanthropic plans, and they're hearing this and saying, this sounds really tough. Why don't we just do cash transfers? You know, or we'll just go to the GiveWell website and pick 
you know, the, the vitamin A distribution. Um, Peter, why do you think it's actually important to do this kind of work, to help build the infrastructure on the ground, the ecosystems, local organizations? Why is that a better approach for that, that billionaire watching us? Well, uh, let's start with the, the question and then come to the billionaire, right? I, I, I think that, you know, global development is a long haul effort and it requires actors that are committed for the long haul. And, you know, I, I spent 11 years of my career with an with a international NGO that I thought did excellent work, and yet it is no longer in the country that I, that I directed the field of. Whereas the civil society organizations that, that we would subgrant to or that we worked along with are still there. And, you know, and that's because this is Mali, right? This is and, Mali. And that's and because it, the, the political and security situation there changed a lot. That's right. But uh, a local organization continues to work regardless of political disruption, regardless of, of uh, you know, the climactic problems, et cetera. So I think there's a, there's a, a, a long haul piece to it. There is, I think, much unrecognized capacity within, uh, within local organizations. An organization like Hilton of the past, I think, would say we need to fund U.S. organizations because they have sophistication. But look around at the organizations that are there now. And I think we should remind ourselves, local is not only community-based. It's also capital city think tanks. It, it's highly specialized organizations in addition to the grassroots. Even the word local maybe isn't the right term to use, right? Because a lot of times we're talking about national organizations that are quite substantial in their own right, and it makes make them seem a bit smaller when from a distance we call them local. Well, it's the language of the colonizer. You know, it's a language that was introduced to be able to determine who is above and who is below. You know, so as long as we recognize that the narrative that we are using, the conversations that we are having, and the, the systems in which we are functioning, are deeply embedded in, a, in, in, in colonization and, and patriarchy, we are not going to change that. So yes, I am not saying it's impossible to get there, but we have to start from a place of recognizing where we come from. I, I, I recognize some of you in the audience. I just want to take a quick poll here. Within your organizations, do you use the word localization? Raise your hand if so, if that word is being thrown around inside your organizations. What about, if, what about the word decolonization? Is that being used inside your organizations? And, and then raise your hand if there's a debate within your organization about which of those words to use. Many of you, yeah. I mean, I'm hearing this from, from others too because it does get to this exact question of whether we're doing kind of a copy paste of the existing system, but more direct funding or is it more of a rewrite, right? Which is, I think, what Dagon is talking about. On the other hand, reorganizing the pieces maybe is better than nothing. Maybe you can get some real efficiency gains. Maybe you can get some more money to local groups that can grow up and be there, be sustainable. Um, maybe that's an intermediary goal. What do, you, what do you think, Monica? Well, as long as we are clear that we are doing that, yen then yes, I am willing to go with you on the journey. But you have to start by recognizing that this is, an, this is a step in the long journey to justice. You know, we are, if you think that that is the, where you want to get, then we have a problem. Mm -hmm. Because then you are reproducing the system of power and capital and the way that society has established itself. But I also wanted to send a message to that billionaire out there. <laughs> Please do. Please do. In Silicon, I just wanted to tell whoever you are that you're not going to continue to be wealthy if you don't invest in the rest of the world. You know, that's not how it works. We are making you wealthy. Yeah, so. We won't have a planet to live on. <laughs> Benjamin, I guess you're thinking about a way forward here at Wings, right? And one of the ways forward, and, and Dagon raised the term intermediary, right? How, who sits between the big funder with the billion dollar endowment and maybe smaller local community groups or even national NGOs? 
And you're arguing at Wings, like, there's, there's a model here. We can use local philanthropies, and we can use associations of local philanthropies. They can be that intermediary, and they are local, they're in the country, they know it better, uh, and they can create that sustainable infrastructure. Is that in itself just an intermediary step? Or do you think ultimately that's kind of the vision we want to get to, that, that if we can build up these local philanthropic groups and associations and make them more like what maybe Ford is for grantees in the United States. Is that the direction you think we ought to ultimately be going for? Yes, I think so. Uh, but I also don't think things are necessarily mutually exclusive. I think that we, especially as we're on a long journey uh, and deep journey that takes different approaches system, system and obviously. Uh, and so uh, we, we, we believe that international solidarity, cross-border giving are needed and they're legitimate and they need to continue. And I hope that even in the ideal future that would still continue. But the reality is that first these resources are very, very, very small compared to the needs. Uh, uh, and second, uh, uh, the ability to get this kind of international funding on the ground is being restricted more and more every day. Uh, and, and so if we put all our eggs into this basket of like a few big international foundations, you know, becoming able to send more money to local uh, NGOs, that may be a very fragile solution because first it's just, you know, a, a small portion of everything, but also because it's so easy for a government to just close uh, the, the, the office of that organization or to just cut this funding. Uh, so and that's not just theoretical, we've seen that, We've right? seen that, we're seeing it. So that's why, again, like building this local resourcing, local philanthropy, local giving for uh, uh, local civil societies and local development is critical, uh, and including on that aspect, because it's much more complicated for a government to, uh, uh, to stop you know, millions of individual donors to support like, you know, a multitude of local actors doing the, the work. So that's just, just another argument about there needs to be massive investments in building this local ecosystem for giving and for philanthropy, in addition to, of course, building and supporting the more, the broader civil society infrastructure locally to, you know, be uh, equipped to, to, to do the work and so on. And yes, there are tools, there are actors, there are networks that are there on the ground that can, you know, that can be a starting point to support this kind of process. And the Wings community itself represents this, this constituency. Uh, and we're working actually with Hilton and, and uh, with Fondation France and a few others in um, new projects that are trying to bring together these actors at the local level and, and, and create momentum around you know, the need to build that ecosystem and create more investments into it so that there are more and better private resources that can lead to development. So there it's, it's possible to, to, to work in this area and that's, that's a critical area we believe in. I'm coming to our audience here for your comments and questions in just a second, so get ready with them. We'll take a few if we can. Um, yeah, I guess, Peter, is there a danger that as we get kind of aligned around the importance of more direct giving, that foundations will simply say, well, the only way we can manage this is to grow. And so US-based foundations will have to hire more staff, add more offices, and sort of become a little bit of what the international NGOs themselves have had to become, that they will in-house that intermediary function, where you think it's realistic to do what Benjamin's described, to really find new intermediaries in the world and really trust them enough to, to give them large percentages of your annual funding to make those decisions on the ground. I think it's much more optimal to do the latter. Uh, I, I think it will be complex and, and uh, it will take some time. But, you know, the intermediary organizations are not simply efficient channels. They are sophisticated interpreters of the political and economic situation that they're in, right? And Ford Foundation has, I think, 10 field offices. So you're way ahead of us in terms of your, your global distribution. But even with that, it's, it's very difficult to know what's going on in the next country over or, or in another region of the same country. So I, I think it is definitely better to work through uh, intermediary organizations that understand policy possibilities, the, the, the strengths and weaknesses of, of, of different organizations. Uh, I think we need to help that part of the ecosystem grow, not only local philanthropy, but, but also 
local regranting NGOs. Right? I think very important. All right, we're going to go to our audience. I'll take a few points. Do we have somebody with a microphone, or will they just? Yeah. yeah. Oh, great. Here, here they come. Um, so wait for the microphone. Tell us who you are, please, and try to keep it short because sadly we don't have too much time. And I'll try to take these three comments in a row. Hi, Rosal McKenna from Open Society Foundations. Um, thank you to the, the panel and the organizers. I mean, my question is really for all of us about how we think about the political strategy that we bring to this, because in this moment of retrenchment in ODA and more transactional aid flows, there's every risk that the timing of this is just terrible with the bilats and the multilats right now. So in addition to us transforming our own institutions, how are we going to beat the drum for this at a time when, frankly, localization might drop off the political priorities for some of those agencies? So I think we need to think about that part as well as the transformation that we can lead on. Thanks. Great point. Thank you. If we can pass the mic forward, whoever has it next. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm Susan Blaustein, um, Women's Strong International. We're a private operating foundation that uh, funds convenes and helps strengthen local women-led organizations uh, so far in 21 countries. And so, so my question, I have two questions actually. For us, localization is about decolonization. It's, it's not just about shifting the money, it's about shifting complete agency. They are the experts, they know best what their communities need. We have vetted them over and over in finding them, and now it's time for us to trust them. And the pandemic, as somebody said, has absolutely accelerated that. So I just wanted to make that point. I don't see them as, as in, in conflict, that it really is a, a power shift. The other question was really for Monica about um, the Global South, because for me, it's, we fund in America as well, and it's very important that we understand that the issues facing women, in, in our case, are in, indeed universal, that the, the violence, the, the structural uh, poverty, the um, health and education challenges, et cetera. So I was just wondering, I mean, because you seem to say there's a global south and a global north, and um, I feel like sometimes we tend to sort of put these things in buckets like the war on poverty, you know, sort of the 60s notion that there's a problem here, but then there's foreign assistance over there and that they're two very different things. And I think there's a solidarity in understanding that so many of these issues are indeed transnational and really about power. Thank you very much. We're Thank you. And please go ahead and pass the mic down. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Salma Talhajibril. I work for the Institute of International Education here in New York. I am from the so-called Global South. We need to stop that. That's number one. My I have a reflection. I'm reading the title of today's panel, Philanthropy's Role in Realizing the Localization Agenda. I wonder if actually this panel should have included a philanthropy with foundation from outside of America. And I wonder if that would have balanced a little more some of the narratives and some of the reflections that we heard today. And if I may change the title, I would say Philanthropy's Role in Fostering People's Agency. And that goes to your point earlier about localizations. I just returned from the United Arab Emirates. As a researcher and evaluator, I have a growing portfolio where uh, eval uh, philanthropies are asking us to measure the impact of the interventions. And I was there, uh, you know, speaking to different stakeholders and partners of Al Ghurair Foundation for Education. It's a foundation that's only been around for five years, but when you look at the impact that they are not only able to create in the country, in the Gulf, and in the region, then you wonder if the Rockefellers and the Carnegies and the Fords are truly investing for impact. So I know that some people might not appreciate what I'm saying, I have been in the United States on and off for 14 years. I'm from both Morocco and Sudan. At some point, we have to keep things real and authentic. And if there is a pledge, it's to actually look at some of the recent private foundations that are emerging from the region and just humble ourselves and ask them, you've created that much impact in five years. 
am I doing something wrong as a Rockefeller and as a Ford and as a, and please, I'm not pointing any foundations. I actually, I'm a firm believer in Ford Foundation's mission, but I'm just saying it is okay to be like, we've been around for a century. Maybe we are not creating the type of impact that we would like to see. So let's change the title, invite uh, a private foundation from other parts of the world, and let's keep it real. Thank you, and, and we do want those provocative comments, so thank you for making them. Um, I'm a little bit worried about time. I know we have several more hands here. I'm looking at you. Can we go, can we go five minutes late, maybe? <laughs> We, we, we will take just two more comments yeah. then. Who, Sasha, you have the mic and then right in front of you, yes. Thanks. Thank you all for this conversation and for that last question. I'm Sasha Fisher with Spark Microgrants. And I'm curious, uh, there's all this discussion around like shifting a percentage of the portfolio to locally led organizations, which yes, locally led organizations or regionally led organizations should absolutely be getting way more capital. Can we go a step further though and pool philanthropic capital and then unrestrict it so that there's not all these ties to how to play the game to get a grant and proactively give grants to every village in every neighborhood around the world that doesn't have the, the capital in it because it's been extracted for the global north. How can we unrestrict money and get it proactively to villages and neighborhoods so they can control it? Thanks. Thank you, Sasha. Thank you, everyone. Um, my name is Nasra Ismail. I see Heba in the back from the Humanitarian and Degen. And so we might just call this the localization roadshow going on 10 years. <laughs> we just have to figure out how to get a vehicle. Um, thank you very much for this. I am a recovering uh, person who's worked in philanthropy and actually hoping to go work for USAID and the likes because we can't give up on them. My question, I think, to your point, um, our, our friend from Ford Foundation is, the people in the Global South are everywhere, including the Global North. You're absolutely right. One of the things I want this audience to consider, maybe for our, our colleagues to comment on, is we're just as concerned about our people of color, underrepresented uh, folks, brothers and sisters in the fight for justice, here in America, as we are as those in civil society in the areas we were born in. And I would love it if every time I've seen an interlocutor or a middle, whatever we're calling them, the middle people, the new INGOs is what I'm calling them, um, if they were really held up to a standard where they're treating underrepresented colleagues and people that they work with and staff as well or better than before they pick up the global hat and come to the global south in terms of outside of North America. I think we've got to put the two together because justice everywhere uh, should be something that we strive for. So I'm kind of sick and tired of INGOs that are treating underrepresented people of color in America poorly, but have this great civil society, democratic institution building, capacity building, what have you, in the global south in Africa. I would love your comments on that, and thank you for a great panel, and Degan, I hope we don't see you in the next 10 years either. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much to all of you for those great points, questions, comments. I don't know that we're going to get all of them. We have, we have very little time here. I want to go back to each of you and just give you a chance. You don't need to address all of them. We're, we're not going to have time to do that. Pick, pick something that's of interest to you if you like. Um, you know, we heard a little bit about uh, the global south, global north dynamic. That might be one to pick up on. Uh, we heard a little bit about the, maybe a double standard. Are the NGOs in the global north living up to standards with their own underrepresented groups here? Um, we heard about another model of aid instead of giving directly to uh, local organizations. What about directly to communities, a kind of cash transfer, but at the community level? So let's just pick up me, Benjamin, I can start with you and think of this as your concluding thoughts as well. Great. No, thanks to everyone. I mean, all the questions and remarks were, were excellent and uh, thought provoking. Uh, I, I, maybe I'll, I'll just start with the first question uh, about also how do we influence other actors, not just transform our philanthropic sector in this regard, but also play this political influence role. Uh, so that's something we're absolutely uh, uh, convinced that we need to do. WINGS itself is trying to do that at the global level, building that collective voice of the philanthropic sector and influencing uh, bilaterals, multilaterals. And we're bringing something specific here because of course it's not about WINGS as a network of you know, philanthropist of organizations telling, you know, a bilateral, oh, you need to, sh you to fund local organizations, near network, and so many others are doing an amazing job there. But what we're telling to them is, 
what I, I was referring to earlier. You need to also invest in building that local ecosystem and growing local resources for, for development and for the common good, because that's a role they can play. Uh, and so that's what we're, we're talking about. And we've had several workshops and conversations with them. We're even discussing with uh, USAID. <laughs> we talked about uh, today a lot uh, about how you know, they're, they're starting to push for some principles to influence other bilateral donors. So we're also going to launch a call to action for philanthropic actors, hopefully with COF and other, other partners, to, to create a sort of movement around that. So the idea is really to look beyond the silos of sectors, and, and it's, it's really uh, something broader, and, and we need to work together. So fu fully agree on that, on that front. But it's not easy, because the philanthropic sector has been very, very used to working as an individual uh, player, and even in this sector, each actor is very individual. And it's so like building a collective voice, a collective policy voice for philanthropy as a sector is something that we're pushing, but it's taking time. So interested in, in, in exploring that further with you. Also, just sorry, and I'll be, I'll be brief because there were so many great questions and comments, but I, I, I love the point about like inviting uh, foundations from, from other regions. I mean, Wings is working with many, many networks and funders from all parts of the world, and that would be great to have one today. Um, I would just challenge a little bit maybe the assumption, and I think it goes back to our point about what localization, localization is, and that it's something deeper than just like, you know, north, south, or south, whatever. It's like, there's this data from the African Philanthropy Forum, who is one of our members, and they've tried to look at uh, donations from African foundations. Um, and they, uh, the number of, uh, I mean, the, f the, the part of their funding going to African NGOs was 9%. Not ours. So it's even lower. Uh, the re you know, it means like they're, they're basically funding, you know, UN organizations, Red Cross, like th these kind of players, or they're implementing their own programs themselves, which can be sometimes very effective, and, but it's a really different model. So that, that I think that localization conversation is absolutely critical and relevant for all players, in, including in uh, uh, emerging economies, global south, uh, well, everywhere. We, 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 I, I also don't like any of these terms, but uh, so, so yeah, I, I, that, that's just to, to add that, that point. But we want to have these conversations everywhere uh, and with all players. Very interesting point. Monica? Well, <laughs> again, I mean, it's hard for me to think where, where to start. But let me start by saying that certainly we are part of the problem, you know, and therefore we need to be part of, of the solution. And 100%, we have been in existence for 80 years. And for the great majority of those years, we have kept organizations on survival mode. We have provided funding that was over-projectized. And it has taken years and a shock to the system and a deep political commitment from our leadership to recognize that and to begin a journey of change as an institution. I don't think we are where we want to be, and we certainly are not where I hope we can be, you know, but the conversations are taking place. So, just to say, but the lesson I have learned and the reason that I remain at the Ford Foundation is that, that we have to be there. You know, we have to be in these institutions. I, as an indigenous person that comes from and having been raised and born in a village, I want to be part of the discussion at the Ford Foundation. I want to be deciding whether we should be spending down our endowment or not. And I am fortunate enough to have a place and a work culture and, and an institution where the president has an open door policy in which I can go in and say some of these things. And most likely will agree and will and will take some steps uh, to to begin that journey of change it still requires a long time i will say because it starts 
with changing with what I started, the soul of who we are. And that soul is on the people and on the, and the institution. And, and that process of transformation is deep because it's about who you consider superior, what knowledge you value the most. In fact, how we define philanthropy, you know, giving and sharing, if that is the concept of philanthropy, has been in existence for thousands of years. You go across communities in different parts of the world, and the concept is there. Whether we decide to call it or not philanthropy is our choice. Sometimes it's a political choice, sometimes it's a technical choice, but philanthropy has always existed in the global south, in the global north, and in communities of, that care for each other. Uh, so we have and we know how to do this. And I think that there are more of us that need to be in these institutions and need to take over these institutions so that we could be having that conversation with that billionaire in, in Silicon Valley and wherever they are. Um, and as professionals, because we are all peers here, you know, every day that you come to work, ask yourself the question of how superior you feel versus the other. You know, and in the process, then integrate some of those practices into the way you are defining the problem, into the way you are defining that solution, into the way you are structuring that grant, and into the way you are speaking about the work that you are doing, in the way you are speaking about your own self. You know, and, and, and I think that if we do one step of that, you know, I can give you a homework. The homework is dedicate 10 minutes every morning, meditate about the tremendous amount of power and privilege that you have, recognize that, and with that come to work. Monica, you are one tough act to follow. <laughs> uh, but I think the point that she just made is extremely important. You know, Foundations may think that they are large actors and that they have power or resources, but the, the greatest channels of philanthropy, the greatest flows of funding uh, to people who are in situations of disadvantage come from their peers. Uh, and, and what philanthropy does is, is to try to help that move forward. Uh, but I think we should not style ourselves to be any sort of superhero. And to my uh, my sister from Morocco, Aziz Ali of Bazaar from Maghreb, I mean, I think that it's great when a foundation profiles itself as being after impact and really pursuing that. But frankly, it's not about the foundations themselves. It's about the organizations that we fund. And it's about what they are trying to do and accomplish. Uh, and I, I, I think if we, we need to keep that humility in mind as, as, uh, as we go forward, I, I totally agree with you that um, this panel would look better and, and would be more convincing and, and better rooted if it had different people here. Uh, and I think my role here is not so much to symbolize something as to admit that there is work to do to get our own house in order. Uh, you know, so I think that work has to go forward even if the leadership, the energy, and the inspiration is coming from where it needs to come from, from, uh, from close to the, uh, the ground. Uh, to, uh, about the question of bilaterals, I totally agree with you. This is a, a very disquieting question. Uh, I think European bilaterals in particular have been wobbling recently, uh, and, and all that we can do to, to help them uh, center and, and steady, I think would be great. This is why it is so exciting and important that actually USAID is trying to do this. They have a lot of internal and external stuff to deal with in order to deliver, but I think we should try to help them do that because it will help the whole aid architecture. Um, and one of the things that foundations, if they are structured to exist in perpetuity, can do is keep the lights on when topics go in and out of political favor. And I think this is really important here. And finally, uh, the question about the Global South and Global North is totally right on. Both 
Monica and, and you yourself, the, the point that you raised, everything we're talking about in terms of getting resources close to the communities uh, that they, and to organizations that arise out of the communities they serve is relevant to the U.S. as well. We've been focusing on the global aspect here because it is UNGA, because, uh, you know, because of the report, but all of it is relevant and all of it uh, I think should be done equally with, with equal vigor um, domestically. Thanks. I'll, I'll just mention as we close, at the beginning of this year, I write every year a, a look ahead article in DevX. I kind of predict the future as best I can, which is a very dangerous business. Uh, and I had five predictions, one of which was this would be a year that we see real progress on localization. And it's the only one of my predictions that I got a lot of people commenting. And many of them said, you're a hopeless optimist. We've been trying this for so many years. Why will this Do it for Raj. be any different? <laughs> yes, please. But I said, the only reason I think this year might be different is because of the foundations. Because foundations are actually starting to change. And it's true, the politics around this are very tough. Maybe USAID won't have the staying power. They might backslide. The only way that this agenda actually has legs is if the foundation world, which is growing at a rapid pace, there's more than 2,000 billionaires just in, uh, around the world and almost 1,000 in this country, that their funding flows are growing. And if they actually make a real commitment to this, whatever the political ebbs and flows are, we may be able to actually build the local institutions and ecosystems, get them to a point where there's a fighting chance for localization, maybe for decolonization at some point. So I hope I'm right about that. We will see, but I'm encouraged. I'm encouraged by this group, and I hope you are too. My thanks to Kathleen, to Dagon, to this panel. Please join us.